Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. We're going to be talking to Kelly Gregg today, another candidate Hello. for our landscape architecture uh, position that we have in the school right now. Um, Kelly's going to tell us a bit about her, herself in the in the presentation, but just a general overview. BLA uh, from Pennsylvania, and then two masters from Michigan, um, one in urban design and one in planning. That's right. Yeah. And uh, currently uh, completing a PhD in planning as well. A member of the OLA as well. So uh, she, knows, she knows some some things in Toronto. <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm learning. Um, so we're going to open it up and have uh, have Kelly provide a presentation for about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have some questions that after that. Uh, for as long as we need, and if you need anything, we'll just let us know. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. Um, as Sean mentioned, I'm uh, Kelly Gregg. Thank you for inviting me to Guelph today. Um, I'll just go over my background a little bit. Uh, so I practiced for a little while after my undergrad at Penn State uh, that was in landscape architecture. Um, and then I had the good fortune of uh, having a bad economic time. So I graduated in 2007, uh, right before the recession. It was great. Uh, easily found a job in landscape architecture, only to uh, be laid off in 2009. So that was what uh, led me to uh, go into planning to sort of diversify uh, my skill set and uh, get some graduate work experience at the time. Uh, but I really uh, became interested in asking these questions about how design and planning are related, um, which ultimately led me to a PhD. Uh, at first, I thought I was just going to do the, the Masters of Urban Design to answer those questions, but uh, questions just led to more questions. Um, but during my master's program, uh, we had a field trip to uh, uh, New York, and it was shortly after they had pedestrianized Broadway in Manhattan. Um, and it sort of led me to my dissertation question, ultimately, um, because I remember the idea of the failed pedestrian mall, and yet we were reintroducing this uh, new pedestrian mall. And Jan Gale had worked with John Sadik Khan on the pedestrianization of, uh, of Broadway, but there were many things um, that were parallel. So ultimately, I, I uh, began to want to look at how these ideas of pedestrianization evolved um, and how they're, they're the same or different in the contemporary context. So uh, here's a temporary pedestrian street uh, on Bloor next to Fresno, California. Um, now, I, uh, interestingly enough, this project uh, was recently removed in uh, 2017. So we have this, this pattern of uh, new interest in pedestrian malls and pedestrianization. At the same time, we're removing uh, uh, mid-century and uh, post-war pedestrian malls. So uh, a little bit about my presentation. I'm going to talk, um, talk about my, my dissertation research that is primarily focused on pedestrianization um, and pedestrian environments and how it's framed within automobility. I'll also discuss my further research plans as well as uh, some of my teaching philosophy uh, and experience. So real briefly, uh, what do you think of when you hear the term pedestrianization? Anyone? No hands? All right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Oh, I was going to say something similar to that. Okay. Making the streets more, more accommodating to pedestrians. to pedestrians. Yeah. What about pedestrian mall? Is it the same? Brennan? I, I associate that with a retail context. Okay. Typically. Yeah. And that was certainly the case in the post war. Um, so I have broadly defined it through my research as uh, a range of actions, um, either through planning and design, that reorient the street uh, away from automobiles and toward pedestrians. And I think there has been an evolution of um, how these design goals have, have changed. But broadly, the physical, um, the physical design is very, very similar. And so much of my work has looked at um, the, the work of Victor Gruen, who was very instrumental in the post-war in developing uh, uh, pedestrian malls. So 
he, uh, Victor Gruen was a Jewish immigrant um, who came to the US uh, from uh, Austria in 1938. And he was fleeing uh, Nazi Europe along with many other architects and intellectuals. And you're probably most familiar with his work as a shopping center designer. Um, he was called the mall maker or also the father of the mall, which in some cases refers to the pedestrian malls. Um, but he really argued um, that downtown um, centers were dying because of the decentralization from uh, suburban development and that we really need to re-centralize cities. And that was evident through many of his uh, city planning proposals that included pedestrian malls. Now in contrast, uh, Jan Gale uh, is a contemporary Danish architect who I think probably most of you are, are more familiar with. Um, and his work has become increasingly global. And he really started out focusing on Copenhagen, but uh, he has worked in Sydney and Moscow, as well as throughout uh, Brazil. And Gale really argues uh, that the public life of cities has been undermined by modernist planning, um, and that we need to reorient public spaces to be more um, sensitive to people's needs and to people using them for public space. So he argues very strongly that cities and downtowns specifically should be uh, not auto-oriented, but pedestrian-oriented. And by doing um, pedestrian-oriented planning, we can change the culture of public life. Now, um, many people think that post-war pedestrian malls um, in North America, like the Kalamazoo Mall here, many people think that these ideas came directly from Europe. And also, many people seem to think that um, pedestrianization ideas that are newly being implemented uh, are a complete break from the past. And Jan Gale, in many ways, promotes this idea uh, that he's breaking from modernist ideas. Um, but today, I'm going to demonstrate, based on my research, how uh, both of these assumptions are not fully correct. Uh, I'll demonstrate how post-war ideas of pedestrianization were conceptualized along with other modernist ideas. And they were circularly transferred, not linearly transferred, between Europe and the US, um, as many people uh, commonly assume now. I will also demonstrate how uh, Jan Gale's uh, contemporary pedestrianization concepts and pede uh, contemporary pedestrianization concepts in general are more of an evolution of the post-war concept than a hard break. So why did we look to pedestrianization in the first place um, as, as a method for improving cities? Um, and Pedestrian malls and pedestrianization concepts really came from modernism and the rise of automobility in, in cities. And here you can see uh, campus marshes in Detroit in 1917, uh, where there's a few automobiles on the streets, but a horse cart, we have pedestrians everywhere, we have uh, streetcars. And this was not unique to Detroit. This was a, a common. Um, image of cities during this time. They were chaotic, they were uh, busy uh, and dangerous. There was a lot of uh, pedestrian deaths uh, because of uh, the, the congestion and the, the chaos. So part of modernism uh, was to rationalize the messiness and, and put everything in a, a neat package. As you can see here, this is an extreme example, but the, these ideas were broadly uh, prevalent. And you can see, I'll emphasize the, the separation by grade of pedestrians and automobiles. And this idea continued to be carried through. Um, Le Cabusier was one of the, the most uh, famous for this. Um, and we think of his ideas as being very European, very modernist. Uh, he promoted the idea of the sidewalk in the sky, uh, the towers in the park, extremely separated land uses. Um, and the, the root of this was to modernize the city and rationalize the city and upgrade it from the messy existing infrastructure that was there. <clears throat> 
Now, these ideas were not only coming out of Europe. Uh, Hugh Ferris, during the, the same time period as Le Corbusier, uh, developed a North American vision of this densification and these towers. Um, here, most of these drawings are inspired by the New York zoning code and the ziggurat uh, building form that followed. Um, but Hugh Ferris is also playing with uh, the separation by grade. And here is an extreme example of one, two, three, four layers of uh, separation. And also the extreme density of building that would, would come with these tower structures. So we, we have these ideas both in, in uh, North America and in, in Europe, but we also have ideas of anti-city and decentralization as a solution. Um, now here we have Henry Ford quoted as, we shall solve the, the city problem by leaving the city. And Henry Ford, though he would benefit greatly from selling a lot of cars and decentralization, uh, he wasn't alone in these thoughts. Uh, most famously, the vision of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broad Acre City also promoted uh, extreme decentralization. Um, and you can see this is all facilitated by uh, flying cars, which would be awesome, and these terrestrial pods as well as uh, larger uh, boat-like structures. <laughs> so uh, this time period was a really uh, creative time period, uh, a moment in history when it seemed like anything was possible and you could solve any problem uh, through technical and artistic innovation that these architects were bringing forward. And those ideas uh, moved into uh, the period during the war as well. And these ideas continued to be broadly explored. And the 1939 New York World's Fair, specifically the General Motors Futurama exhi exhibit designed by Norman Bel Geddes, really started to bring these ideas um, of avant-garde architecture to a more general audience. Uh, and hundreds of people visited uh, the World's Fair exhibit and at uh, the Futurama World's Fair exhibit. And really, Bel Geddes addressed uh, the roadway networks and the rationale for building roadways. And of course, he was very heavily supported and encouraged by General Motors, uh, who were already lobbying for this. Um, and the, the car companies were heavily involved in advocating for better roads, as well as tire manufacturers and oil companies, because it benefited them for selling cars and, and other products. Um, but the vision for this became much like Le Corbusier, as you can see here, and uh, also like Hugh Ferris with the, the separated grades. So this became the image that more general audiences saw, and it became the future or the image of the future. But along with that, um, roads were part of the solution for the congestion of cities. Um, but as we find, they would come to dominate the landscape. But the rational road network system that was championed by Gettys and presented at the World Fair um, really was the baseline of many of the road designs uh, that we see now across the US and across Canada. Uh, but in retrospect, we, we do understand some of the detrimental impacts of the early adoption of automobility. But in the 20th century, the early 20th century, um, automobility was really seen as a democratizing force for transportation. With your car, you could go anywhere. And new opportunities for land development also arose with uh, decentralization and with road, with road networks. And this road network idea <clears throat> was spread not only um, <coughs> not only to the, um, to the regional areas and the cities, it, it became a national agenda. And the idea was that roadways and highway networks could connect across the United States, and not only uh, nationally, but across the borders to Canada and, and to Mexico as well. 
And this was a, another method of facilitating uh, massive decentralization. But it didn't really solve the problem of congestion in the cities because as you built more uh, on the peripheral areas, the more uh, demand you had for automobility within the city centers. And later in the mid-century and during the war, there was uh, a recognition of many of the social and cultural impacts of automobility. And it began to be seen as a problem. And downtowns were suffering as well. Now, during the war, uh, many planners, uh, architects, uh, and landscape architects didn't have much work <laughs> because, of the, uh, uh, because of World War II. So the exercise of envisioning the future after the war became a really popular uh, activity. And here you can see uh, a plan for Syracuse, New York, that was part of the new buildings for 1940X uh, organization. Now this, this issue um, was for architectural form and they partnered with Fortune Magazine uh, and asked many of the very influential architects of the time to design, to design buildings. So there's a new design for City Hall, there's a new design for a bank, bakery, etc., theater, restaurant, uh, post office. So they all designed these uh, new buildings and uh, George Nelson and Henry Wright, who were the editors of Architectural Forum at the time, envisioned it fitting into this downtown master plan for Syracuse, New York, complete with one of the first uh, ideas of a, a pedestrian mall. And they do call it a pedestrian mall uh, and a ribbon of green running through downtown uh, organizing the new buildings. Now, among the, the influential architects uh, that were asked to design buildings uh, was Victor Gruen, and he was asked to design uh, the new shopping center. And these are new, new ideas that we take for granted now, the shopping center, uh, the grocery store, and they were all uh, being envisioned uh, during the war. But the plan continued to be uh, focused on revitalizing the downtown in light of the su suburban decentralization that was auto-oriented and was already affecting uh, Syracuse as well as many other cities. Now, George Nelson continued to introduce the idea of pedestrianizing uh, a shopping street and specifically the idea of grass on Main Street. And here in the popular magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, uh, he introduces the idea of grass on Main Street and the caption read, your children can romp while you shop. And this also reminds us that shopping at this time continued to be considered a woman's activity. So many of these spaces were designed with that in mind and they were designed to be comfortable and safe spaces for shopping. Now, the actual implementation of pedestrian malls lagged behind in North America. There were more uh, suburban shopping centers that were springing up before pedestrian shopping centers. So uh, multiple urbanists, uh, including Victor Gruen, as well as uh, Lewis Mumford, looked to some European examples. Um, and the line bond is one of them uh, that was widely looked to, not only in North America, but across Europe. And it was a really highly modernist vision of pedestrianization. Um, and it was all newly built in a bombed out section of downtown Rotterdam. And one very interesting thing is that the line bond, in fact, it wasn't like the uh, medieval winding pedestrian streets that we think of uh, that are lined with cobblestones and uh, quite beautiful and interesting. Uh, the line bond, in fact, was emulating uh, North American suburban shopping center designs. And the architects from the line bond actually came to the United States when they were planning the line bond uh, to, to see the model that was uh, created there. And, in turn, Victor Gruen 
uh, visited the line bond while he was planning uh, for a, the downtown plan for Fort Worth, which I will uh, explain in more detail. But that's just one example of how ideas were uh, more circularly transferred during uh, the, the early post-war years than is commonly recognized. Now, where many of the ideas from 1940 or 1940X uh, remained in the imagination of architects, uh, Victor Gruen became one of the first to develop uh, his shopping centers into reality. And I argue that he be perhaps became one of the most influential uh, modernist architects, as his ideas were widely popular, popularized, unlike many uh, architects that remained more avant-garde. Um, and here with, with the Northland Shopping Center, um, it really became an image for suburban life, and all supported by the automobile, as well as uh, a robust network of roads, including a highway. Um, and the idea, so this was an open shopping center, unlike many of the enclosed shopping centers that we know now. But the idea was to concentrate all of the pedestrian activity in the middle um, and really make a lovely environment whoops, for people to enjoy. And as you can see, this looks much like many of the downtown pedestrian malls. Um, throughout the early development of the Northland Mall, it was really emphasized that the pedestrian experience was important. And it was also thought that the pedestrian experience was key to the mall's economic success. And despite the modernist organization of the Northland Mall, uh, Gruen continued to compare it to a market town concept. And Jane Jacobs, who was editor of Architectural Form at the time, picked up and published these ideas as well. Uh, she also called Northland Mall a planning classic. And her and Gruen also promoted the idea that Northland's pedestrian experience could be imported to downtown malls uh, and business districts as a way of revitalizing them. And it was based on Northland's success uh, as a shopping center that Gruen was hired on a speculative uh, basis for the Fort Worth Tomorrow plan. Now this was a comprehensive plan uh, to reorganize the downtown of Fort Worth. And uh, as you can see here, it's a, a pedestrian concept and the idea was to limit automobile traffic to the outer edge of downtown. Um, and this is like Similar to other utopian visions presented earlier uh, with Le Cabousier and Frank Lloyd Wright, Gruen's uh, plan inspired many other built works. However, it was practically unattain unattainable uh, by itself because of its scale. Um, but the main concept of Fort Worth was to uh, bring human activity back to the downtown and bring a human scaled environment as you can see here. But this meant <laughs> severely uh, destroying the existing infrastructure. As you can <laughs> see, this would, these are the parking areas uh, that were envisioned for Fort Worth uh, connected to the, the ring road. And it takes out blocks and blocks of existing buildings. So from a, a practical standpoint, it was very difficult, <laughs> if, if not completely impossible, but uh, it makes a lovely uh, pedestrian-oriented center uh, where you can walk and meander um, throughout the city. Now, though this was not built, there were many that were built after uh, and somewhat inspired by the Fort Worth plan that was widely publicized. Now, Kalamazoo was one of them. And they did hire Gruen to do a downtown comprehensive plan. Uh, and they also, in the plan, pl had planned to do many more uh, pedestrian streets to make a network. However, only the main street, the Burdick Street, was uh, pedestrianized in the end. Uh, but when it opened in 1959, 
it became the first uh, permanent pedestrian mall in North America. And as you can see here, uh, around 1960, it, it was quite busy. Uh, there was a lot of pedestrians, and even uh, if it wasn't pedestrianized, it seems like there would be uh, a, a congestion on the sidewalks with that many people uh, if, there were ro if there were cars going down the center of the road. Um, and though Kalamazoo uh, failed to implement the larger central organization uh, structures as part of the Gruen plan, many, many cities looked to Kalamazoo as a model. Uh, in the first several years alone, hundreds of cities visited Kalamazoo uh, to see their success and to see this idea of the pedestrian mall that had been circulating for uh, probably two decades beforehand actually come to life uh, in a North American downtown. And likewise, uh, Gruen was involved in developing uh, the Fulton Street Mall in Fresno, California. Now where uh, Kalamazoo faltered in developing larger central organization, uh, uh, Fresno was more successful. Not 100% successful, but more successful. Uh, and he worked with Garrett Ekbo uh, to, to design this amazing, uh, very modernist landscape. Uh, and it was widely celebrated. Um, now also Fresno was one of the first projects to utilize uh, urban renewal funding uh, that came under the Federal Housing Act um, and was distributed through HUD. And Fresno was widely promoted, not only by Gruen, uh, but also by HUD. And they award, awarded Fresno an Urban Design Award um, that further promoted this idea of, of revitalizing the city center through pedestrianization. And here I show uh, the building of pedestrian, you, pro you may not be able to read the, the numbers, but this is starting in 1955 and going to 1990. So, the building of pedestrian malls uh, in the, the post-war. And you can see it's strongly linked to um, the Federal Housing Act non-residential allowance increases. So under HUD, uh, it was distributed under HUD, the initial act started out with only 20% of projects uh, could be non-residential. So that's the total cost of projects. And the cities continued to lobby uh, for increases in this, and it eventually increased to 35%. And as you can see, there's some incremental increases in the building of pedestrian malls. And I, over 60% uh, of all projects in the U.S. Uh, were in some way funded by federal funding. Um, and you can also see there's a subsequent decrease once uh, funding shifted to community development block grants, which were more distributed and less uh, large sums of money, uh, the, the construction of pedestrian malls also declined. Now, this wasn't just a few regions of, of uh, the US and Canada. As you can see, there's a few sprinkled in Canada. Um, and I think the reason for that is primarily because a lot, of, uh, a lot of ideas are exchanged between the US and Canada, at least with, with planning concepts. But um, it was in all of the most populous regions of the United States, uh, pedestrian malls were built. However, we know <laughs> they weren't the most successful. Um, in the end, they continued to be measured by their success at revitalizing retail districts. And as you can see, uh, this is the Old Town Mall in Baltimore, Maryland. This is an extreme example uh, because many were removed. The Old Town Mall remains, but all the stores are vacant. Um, this is in the afternoon, uh, <laughs> a fall afternoon. Uh, and it's quite interesting. And many, many cities did remove their pedestrian malls um, because they were considered failures. but. As you can see, it wasn't regional where they removed them. So the white dots are uh, the reopened pedestrian malls, and only a few remain uh, pedestrian today. 
And as we move forward, here's the timeline of removals of post-war pedestrian malls. Uh, the Fresno Mall was removed uh, in 2016. Uh, <laughs> so the same time we're talking about new uh, pedestrian ideas and implementing new pedestrian malls, we're removing the post-war pedestrian malls. Um, and that raises a lot of questions, uh, which I will get to a little bit later. But going back to the, the idea exchange between North America um, and, and Europe. Now, Gruen uh, worked internationally once he retired from uh, Victor Gruen Associates, and he started Victor Gruen International. And uh, here you can see a sketch of Fresno next to a, a sketch of uh, downtown Antwerp, where Gruen was hired. Now, uh, Gruen was hired by the Grand Bazaar Corporation to envision a suburban location for their department store and a, a, a small shopping center. And he argued uh, that the reinvestment uh, of the Grand Bazaar Corporation should be in the downtown. And he organized with other architects uh, and the city to convince the Grand Bazaar Corporation to develop a plan to reinvest in downtown. And as you can see, uh, in the 60s, uh, when this was taken, the report was 1970, but I assume that this image was slightly before that, uh, European cities, too, were struggling with automobile uh, dominance in their downtown. But they made a choice. And fortunately, uh, the, the uptake in automobility in Europe was slightly behind the US because of the, the economic setbacks and the reconstruction of the war. But they made a choice. And here's Victor Gruen, uh, uh, International Associates image of pedestrianizing uh, downtown Antwerp. And they did in invest in this plan. Uh, it took a very long time, but over time, uh, they pedestrianized nearly the entire central area of Antwerp. And as you can see today, it's a vibrant pedestrian area, uh, vibrant with shops and, and uh, pedestrian walkability. And overall, uh, pedestrian ideas have remained uh, stronger and more uh, influential uh, and continued to develop in uh, European context. Here's the line bond uh, more recently. This picture was taken at night, so the shops are closed uh, and there are not many pedestrians out, but it's still a vibrant retail district um, more than 50 years after it has been implemented. So it raises the question, uh, and I think Jane Jacobs uh, can say it better than, than myself. So how to accommodate city transportation without destroying the related intricate and concentrated land use? This is the question. Or going at it another way, how to accommodate intricate and concentrated city land use without destroying related transportation? So we see a drastic difference between North America and Europe and how they developed uh, their transportation networks. Um, and we, uh, in North America, seem to look to highways much more than in Europe. And here you can see uh, an early completion of the Gardner Expressway. This image is from uh, 1968. And uh, it's quite dominant on the landscape. And this is the legacy of infrastructure that we continue to have today. And though some parts are being removed, there's still a, a major reliance on highway infrastructure. And a, ma a main part of it is, is still existing. And I have to think, uh, looking at this image, it looks much like <laughs> the uh, Le Cabousier image of separated and extreme, uh, extreme uh, towers and extreme separation, extreme rationalization. And this was across North America. Uh, Cincinnati, a smaller city, but one that I know well, if you just look at these highway networks in context of how many blocks 
they consume around the, the perimeter of the city. Um, this is very, and by the way, Victor Gruen also did a plan for downtown Cincinnati. Uh, none of it was really implemented. Um, they went with extreme highways <laughs> instead. But you have to think, uh, this is the, the infrastructure that we're living with. Uh, and one of my favorite examples, uh, a city that was devastated by its own creation, Detroit, they also knocked out blocks and blocks of uh, existing urban fabric to uh, build highways. And this was extremely disruptive, um, not only to the residents that were there, but um, also the just the circulation and the, the life of people that had to get from e. you had to drive now. And thinking of these highway landscapes, like I just think what, what takes place here? Like how do you experience this landscape? Um, is this a space of just simply passing through? Like how do we experience this? What, and does it get any better than this? Like, can't it be better than this? Um, but also, in contrast, automobility enables us uh, to experience landscapes that we might not otherwise be able to reach. Uh, this is the Great Continent Continental Divide uh, in Colorado. Uh, so it's an extremely high elevation, uh, and it would be difficult to experience this landscape uh, any other way. I mean, you could be dropped in by a helicopter, but then you walk around <laughs> and you can't get very far uh, on foot to see this spectacular uh, landscape. Uh, also, uh, we continue to think about how uh, we're using automobiles. And here, you, here we see uh, Victor Gruen Associates sketch of the Bay Fear shopping center in San Lorito, California from 1956. Um, and this dr drawing really emphasizes uh, the experience from the perspective of the automobile driver. We live our lives in, in our cars or in and out of our cars, um, in North America at least. And again, this reminds us, uh, it's a woman driver approaching the shopping center uh, to have a lovely day of, of shopping. So I return to uh, Gruen and Gale and think, how are they the same? How are they different? Well, they both argue to limit automobility in cities and promote ac uh, pedestrian activity and public space. Uh, Gruen, however, in many ways, uh, he accepted automobility through his shopping center proposals. Um, and he had accepted that there had already been uh, continental cultural shifts in, uh, in public life and in life with automobiles. Now, Gale, in contrast, argues that pedestrianization can change the culture of public life. And these, these are really the main differences, um, I believe, of Victor Gruen and Gale. However, they come from many of the same roots. Now, uh, much of Jan Gale's arguments are around incremental ideas and tactical pedestrianization um, as he uh, proposed for Broadway here. But there were other temporary pedestrian malls uh, throughout North America before permanent malls and also simultaneously with permanent malls. Toledo, Ohio, for example, uh, did multiple iterations of temporary pedestrian malls uh, throughout the summers of 1958, 1959, and 1960. Uh, uh, Toronto Young Street was also temporarily uh, pedestrianized in the 70s. So this idea of incremental um, pedestrianization and just testing it out, it wasn't really anything new. Um, although we've seen it take off a bit more, uh, I would argue, and we no longer believe that, uh, in master planning or that that is a, a relevant exercise, I think we're moving more towards these uh, tactical interventions. Now, uh, much of Jan Gale's uh, influence and inspiration comes from the Stroget, uh, 
uh, which was the pedestrian street in Copenhagen. Now, uh, uh, Stroget, as I'm probably mispronouncing, <laughs> was uh, pedestrianized starting in 1962, and they also started with testing uh, to see how this, the street would work as a pedestrian street. And they incrementally expanded it and incrementally upgraded the materials. But he strongly argues that that was his inspiration for uh, Broadway. Uh, however, I found through my research, well, and I've also carefully looked to see uh, if Jan Gale was in any way directly influenced by Victor Gruen um, and how how that might work. Um, but, and he claims that he, he uh, has not been influenced by the modernist uh, architects and, and modernist planners. However, uh, in 1962, just after the opening of the Storget, uh, Victor Gruen spoke in Copenhagen to the Royal Danish Academy, the same school that Jan Gale had graduated from just a year earlier. Also, in 1968, Victor Gruen returned to speak in Copenhagen uh, when Jan Gale uh, was studying the Stroget uh, as a professor at the same Royal Danish Academy. Now, um, Victor Gruen was speaking on North American pedestrianization and uh, urban renewal plans. So I have to think that he must have, in some way, uh, been at least indirectly influenced by uh, Victor Gruen. So moving forward uh, with my research, uh, I'm going to continue to look into street design uh, and expand my work in uh, pedestrianization and the evolution of pedestrianization. And I would like to develop it into a full manuscript uh, eventually. And I've outlined some, some ways of doing that. Um, but also, uh, I like to think sort of broadly about the future of automobility. Um, and as I re referenced earlier of the Broadacre City Plan, uh, which was envisioned more than 80 years ago, we're still waiting for our flying cars. Um, <laughs> and many theorists have uh, talked, John Urey specifically, has talked about how uh, we will reach post-car. Uh, and how it will become just a tipping point from small incremental changes um, and will eventually reach this tipping point where we no longer use these archaic machines as he describes them. But as we are on the threshold of self-driving technology, um, I really like to think about what, what will this do for the system of automobility? Um, and I argue that it will only further reinforce uh, the auto-centric auto landscape. Um, and what are the potential environmental and social impacts of this new developing te technology? What are the risks of further sprawl and further expansive development into the exurban landscape? Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> Uh, a lot of my research has focused on um, already existing uh, strategies that challenge the dominance of automobility, and uh, complete streets being one of them, also shared streets and pedestrian streets. And though each of these strategies are in some way defined by their relationship uh, to automobility, pedestrian streets, for example, fully exclude automobiles shared streets, you dynamically negotiate with the automobile. And complete streets is a bit modernist in its vision in that you separate spaces and you have each space uh, as a separate unit for each mode. Um, but I think these are real opportunities um, as we develop, uh, inevitably develop uh, autonomous vehicle technology, we need to think of these strategies and how they can uh, balance and manage the further demand of automobiles as we see new technology being uh, introduced. Also, um, tactical pedestrianization has become an interest, and I would really like to bring forward some of the research that I've done on uh, the post-war tactical, but also expanding into uh, the contemporary tactical uh, with street festivals and uh, pop-up summer streets 
uh, and pop-up parks, and there's just a whole plethora of these pedestrianization uh, strategies, which I think is really interesting because in the post-war, it was really focused on the pedestrian mall um, as a more singular and unified concept. But uh, today we see a much broader uh, concept of pedestrianization and, and challenging um, uh, the public space, if you will, or the street space in a variety of ways. And with that, like, how, does, how do these challenges uh, come about uh, and what do they mean for public space? So uh, there's been a number of these uh, parking space uh, initiatives. Toronto has been doing it. This is Cummington, Kentucky. Cincinnati has been doing it. And this is uh, the 16th Street Mall in Denver, uh, which was a post-war uh, pedestrian mall. But they've upgraded it with some tactical interventions uh, to refresh it. And they've also done some pop-up plazas. So just further probing into those things uh, in the future is something that I hope to do. So also reaching into my teaching uh, agenda and, and background, uh, I used to uh, most of my teaching experience comes from when I used to work for uh, the University of Cincinnati Community Design Center uh, and Niehoff Urban Studio, where I collaborated um, with my, my director and I. I was the assistant director. And we organized uh, stu studios around urban ideas within the, the Cincinnati region. So uh, health and urbanism was one. Uh, transportation uh, was another uh, while I worked there. But really, uh, how to integrate these uh, community issues in a studio environment. And we worked interdisciplinary with, usually with planning uh, and civil engineering. There wasn't a landscape architecture department when I worked there. They just started one. Um, so much of my uh, research ideas and, and teaching are integrated around these design topics. Um, and I really am rooted in a design-oriented background with my teaching. And I, I like to challenge students, um, not only in the design classes, but in, in more planning-oriented classes as well, that uh, design thinking can be quite useful uh, for uh, solving any problem. <laughs> and whenever possible, engaging uh, com communities in a meaningful way. Uh, I learned that importance in, in my work at, in Cincinnati very much so. Um, and also, I think it's so important. Um, I find in the planning program, uh, many students are just looking for the right answer. And, uh, but we really need to train critical thinking students and, and encourage them to take risks. Uh, because that's the future. Like, there's a lot of unknowns, and we have to be able to comfortably navigate um, thinking through some of these very large problems, uh, climate change being one of them, automobility, as I've been focusing on. Um, but just a little bit about some of these outcomes uh, from my, my teaching experience. Uh, I, I tend to integrate charrettes in <laughs> every class if possible. So I had a, a, some studio classes which are much more comfortable with the charrette environment, but I also taught a small seminar uh, that had a charrette component uh, over a weekend uh, part of the course. And it was really great to see the students sort of be pushed out of their comfort zone uh, and, and working in that environment. Now, uh, here's some of the results from the, the Niehoff studio work. So these are um, students that are already quite experienced in, in the design process. But this is a rethinking an urban plaza uh, or a suburban plaza to be more urban and, and, and more densely planned. But more than that, like, I like encouraging students to make things that are useful for the community. This is a really simple idea, uh, but an, a lovely illustration of how, um, how programming of a park uh, and what activities occur throughout the year and time of day. Um, and this was really useful for the community just to, to drill down in and say, this is the possibility of what can happen in this space. I see some people squinting, so I'm happy to provide <laughs> a, a better copy. Um, but 
this was my civil engineering students, and I was really impressed that they pushed themselves in, into graphics this far. Um, but they loved thinking through uh, this temporal aspect of, of space. Uh, and then back to the, uh, the charrette uh, with the uh, seminar course. So it was a, a green infrastructure seminar. And we were working with a community in the east end of Cincinnati that's right on the river and quite prone to flooding. Now, there's some conflicts there because uh, the residents really wanted to look at how to repopulate their, their neighborhood, but the area was clearly cl prone to flooding. So we try to um, honor their desires, but also present a realistic vision uh, for what that area uh, might be. So here's just a real rough sketch of some uh, berm improvements, but we also created a map uh, of the baseline flood elevation and a little illustration of how high and where uh, that height needed to be provided in order to meet the baseline flood elevation. That had been, this was done in 2013, I think, and it had been recently updated um, at, uh, around that time. And as you can see, the neighborhood uh, is already emptying out a bit and uh, in the US, FEMA has been buying properties uh, liberally to discourage building, but there's a number of residents that really wanted to reinvigorate uh, this neighborhood, and there's been a number of businesses uh, re-establishing <laughs> re here. So uh, it, it's a conflicting moment, but also an opportunity to show the reality. Um, and I don't think any building has actually happened there. I should drive by. It's flooded probably three times since this was done. <laughs> so, uh, but that's the fun of working with communities. <laughs> um, so I thank you for your time. Uh, and I welcome questions, comments, anything. I'm going to take a sip water. Yeah, thank you. Let's start us off. Martin's got a question. Yeah, I do. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. Historical approach. Thank you. I was just wondering, can you talk a little bit? I mean, for one of my interests, my own dissertation is based on Oklahoma City, so I see a lot of kind of commonalities yeah. in terms of the implications of, of automobile traffic on the downtown core. Mm -hmm. But I was also wondering if you had any thoughts about um, the implications of that physical layout with regards to the neighborhoods, and specifically about the racial implications about, about urban renewal and how much of a strategy that was in really disrupting primarily African-American neighborhoods. Yeah, so I would argue that the highways were really um, the, the strategy of disrupting the the African American neighborhoods and going back to Cincinnati, there's been some interesting research done recently. Um, the whole West Side was a very vibrant uh, African American community here, and as you can see, it's blocks and blocks and blocks. Um, now the the downtown pedestrian malls uh, really didn't remove buildings uh, like the highway building did. Uh, and that was one of the, I think one of the interesting aspects of it, because we always think of urban renewal as blight removal. And there were some m minor building removals to build parking garages, but it wasn't nearly the scale of the highway building. So I see it as more of like an infill, because they were mostly building on the existing road street right away. Uh, and, but the ideas were, um, were to bring the middle class back to downtown. So in some ways, it had a racial implication in that um, the, the social economic makeup of the downtown wasn't quite what they had wanted it to be. Uh, so they tried these strategies to make them more comfortable spaces for middle class audiences. Did that answer your question? No, it does. Thank okay. you. I've got two things. Um, sure. You haven't mentioned smart growth, which is something that our provincial government has gone into. Mm -hmm. And so 
they're sort of aiming for neighborhoods of about 800 meters. And it seems that they're thinking about pedestrianizing, but haven't been able to figure that out. Um, the question being then, with a, an urban environment as big as Toronto, the Toronto Centre region, um, is it feasible to have subunits around these things, the, these uh, pedestrian malls, throughout the fabric of a very large urban centre? So do you mean like multiple neighbourhood level pedestrian centres or pedestrian malls? I don't see why not. Well, and, and Toronto has the uh, existing transit connectedness that uh, makes it uh, really accessible. Um, so I see smart growth as more of like sort of the contemporary analogous to the neighborhood unit concept. Um, but I'm not s extremely familiar with the, with the existing uh, planning ideas as it's, as it's manifested in the, the Ontario legislation. But um, I, and I'm not arguing that pedestrianization should be applied everywhere. Um, and I'm not really arguing how it should be applied. I'm just trying to probe into uh, how these ideas uh, came about. And my, my main thesis is that uh, we may be replicating a flawed model um, with the post-war pedestrian malls that were sort of acontextually recreated in many, many cities uh, across North America. Um, and that became uh, a flawed model. Now, there are some differences in that they were implemented for retail uh, revitalization. And we're now looking at them more as a public space concept. Um, but we need, I think we need to uh, realistically look at it and not blindly replicate uh, pedestrianization without recognizing uh, that there might be some limitations to the, the contextual differences. Did that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. John, did you have a second one? Or no? Yeah, I guess the second one is we continue to struggle with green infrastructure in terms of trying to deal with that. With that. And it seems to be I was going to say confounded by smart growth in that they have much higher densities, yep. much more uh, impermeable surface, so we're creating significantly more flooding um, with one on one side, and yet we're trying to uh, create more soft landscape mm -hmm. uh, for our infrastructure. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a conflict between uh, urban and, and well, and landscape urbanism, for example, or, or green infrastructure. Um, and I think, I mean, part of it is a, a value judgment. Like, do you value density uh, over these other, um, other strategies of, of development? Or uh, rather, how can you build densely uh, and still manage the landscape in a... Um, a holistic way. Um, they're very, like these are sort of the Le Cabousier. I'm sorry, all of my thoughts end up being historic right now because I'm writing this historic dissertation. But I think of the difference between like the Le Cabousier model and the Broadacre City model, and uh, they're they're conflicting in a lot of ways. Um, and we'll never see a city that's all one or all the other, it ends up being uh, a series of knit together pieces. Yeah, I guess the only thing is that the provincial government loves blanket policy and uh, one size fits all. Yeah, but I don't think that's the reality of how we build cities. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> <clears throat> Other questions for Kelly? Yeah, Brendan. Um, this is just like a really detail-oriented question. Sure. Um, the one of the charts that you showed um, that had like the broad pattern, the broad sort of pyramidal pattern of building more and more of these pedestrian malls and then they drop off. You want the they, that, that one? There's also the rhythm of the the dips. Uh huh. And I was just curious about 
what what explains that pattern, whether it's like an election cycle or it just stood out. It, I was like, yeah. It almost seems like every three or four years it, it drops back down to a baseline. Let's base see, point. what's that? Like, that's 66. That's 62. This one I know is because of uncertainty of the continued um, urban renewal funding. Uh, 66, I'm not sure. Uh, this is also number of pedestrian malls, so like a few were built, but not, not as many. Um, and this is the this is based on the year that they opened. So many were in planning and construction for a long uh, period of time. So uh, that that is a good question, though. I'm not sure. I, I think this one is probably most likely because of the uncertainty of the funding going forward. Um, but I really I'm not sure about this one. But it was like it really didn't gain momentum until the the late sixties. Is this both Canada and US data? Yeah, well no, this one so I have Canada and US data in this one. Whoops, sorry, the this one. Um, but the the other one is just US because it's looking at the uh, federal funding. If you were to look at this, I think there's only a few points of Canada. But do you know the periodicity of those? Um, they they were a little bit later uh, than most of the American ones, but only by hairs. Like um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but like Spark Street uh, in uh, Calgary. Uh, I would say the the wave is slightly skewed, but the the sample is so small, it's hard to say if it's significant or not. Do you know if they relate to any sort of federal or provincial? Uh, some of so Canada had a, a uh, some main streets and downtown programs, um, and there were some ideas circulating uh, around those in smaller towns, uh, but it didn't end up resulting in a whole lot of building of them. But the ideas were were presented. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I would like to look into further with my manuscript development um, as a little bit more detail on both Canada and, and U.S.'s uh, like downtown Main Street policies and plans. Because um, that, that, was, that was somewhat part of it, but especially in the U.S., like HUD was really promoting these ideas um, as well. But I think some of the Main Street stuff came a little bit later. Uh, and I'm also hoping to include, uh, as part of the overall evolution of the idea of pedestrianization, uh, um, festival marketplaces came in, uh, development around the, the 80s. Uh, and they, at one, that, my, my committee wanted me to pare things down, so I didn't look at festival marketplaces in the end. But uh, at one point I charted it, and it's really interesting, like festival marketplaces start going up right, right around the time that uh, pedestrian malls decline. And it's a very similar concept of retail um, oriented around pedestrianization. Uh, now, not all of them were implemented on streets per se, but uh, sort of the, the same concept of linking retail environments and pedestrian use. Larry, I'm thinking sort of, you know, not just, these, these were all downtown pedestrian. Yes, and they were, uh, I limited my sample there were a number that were uh, built along types of things. I limited my sample to just uh, with the goal of, of uh, revitalizing retail. Um, so Lincoln, Nebraska did uh, a mall oriented toward the state capitol. Uh, there were a few other outliers like that. I limited it to just uh, uh, retail oriented malls. My question is beyond you know, with the focus of what would the parallel graph look like there for suburban shopping malls? Oh, sort of no, yeah. Analogs. So, no, so I, I did graph it. I didn't include it in this presentation, but it is part of my dissertation. So I mapped the year, um, the difference in year that the, the downtown pedestrian mall was built and its analogous uh, shopping center. Um, and it skews uh, that the pedestrian malls were reactionary to the, the shopping centers. So um, 
I don't remember like the skew to the years exactly, but I, I'd be happy to share that uh, graph with you. Well, it's just interesting because I mean, I'm learning more about all of the shopping malls now that are becoming um, yeah. abandoned. Right? Yeah. You know, so that we have a whole new, you know, kind of massive part of the landscape. Yep. You know, that was, that was a product of automobility, as you call it, you know, which, which is now, you know, uh, collapsing as, as infrastructure. Well, and that's a question to probe going forward. Like, because uh, these shopping centers are declining, like, it, do do we have a new uptick in pedestrian interventions? I I don't think they're as linked as they were in the mid-century, um, because uh, all downtown malls were really linked to the idea of revitalizing the downtown retail, and most of that was because of the declining tax base and and how much cities were reliant on the tax base of the the central area. Um, so, yeah, but I I would argue that we're we're seeing a rise in more entertainment oriented uh, pedestrian areas rather than retail oriented. Just another sort of question, the relationship between sort of the downtown malls, like the Eaton Centers, you know, which yeah. you know, Guelph had one, and Winnipeg had one, yep. and, you know, you know every, every place that had an Eaton's had an Eaton, you know, a, a downtown mall, kind of a conversion of, you know, something from a, you know, kind of department store yeah. to, to some sort of, of a, you know, fragmented uh, urban, uh, and, urban environment. Yeah. Oh, so when those, I mean, in, in, in the sequence of that, I mean, it seems to me, in my memory, that's a kind of a thing of the 80s and the 90s. Absolutely. You know, that's absolutely of, right. You know, uh, you know, it was a competition to some of the, the malls, but something quite different, you know, than, than, than you know, the pedestrianized street. Kind of. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. They, um, I think maybe many cities tried pedestrian malls first, and this was the, the enclosed shopping center in the downtown became uh, a new concept for revitalizing retail in the downtown uh, when other strategies had, had failed, mainly the, the pedestrian mall. It seems like a convergence of the suburban idea. With Absolutely, the yeah. Idea. Well, and the, the pedestrian mall itself was really rooted in the idea of a shiver, suburban shopping center. It just manifested in a slightly different form that wasn't enclosed. So once enclosed malls became really popular, I guess they probably thought, well, we could just do that in downtown too. But they really, um, they really didn't improve any of the the retail environment or the shops in the downtown either. <laughs> so, I think the what's fascinating to me is why why no one thought why do we need to bolster the retail in the downtown? Why didn't they look at other uses and possibilities in the downtown uh, to, to maintain their revenue. Because retail was rapidly changing as an econo like downtown retail economically went away. <laughs> and I mean, we're going to see catastrophic shifts in retail again uh, with online retailing. Um, and I think it will be reinforced with uh, autonomous delivery. So, um, so, so now we have Walmart driving the smart centers, um, and you noted in your presentation that big corporations had driven the shopping mall, the pedestrian mall, in many ways. So, is there is the big box conglomerate that smart centers are producing? just another repetition of the past uh, design of retail within the urban environment? Oh, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I really haven't looked at contemporary retail uh, that much. Um, I would argue that w like, we've moved away from uh, Contemporarily, we've moved away from retail being an important aspect anyways. We've moved towards more of an experience and entertainment driven uh, environment. And those types of places are more important than being able to, to buy something. And even if you have a shop to go buy something, um, 
it's not really about buying, but browsing or being seen browsing the finir, you know? So uh, I would, I guess I'm maybe catastrophically pessimistic and thinking like, it doesn't matter if we have shops or not. Uh, what's most important is we have a place to have a beer or a place to uh, have a pizza or hang out uh, in a coffee shop. And, and I think that really falls in line with a lot of the ideas of Richard Florida and the creative class. And um, he's not the only one to think of these things. But it's really um, our economy has changed. And interacting with people is more important now um, in space than it was seen to be uh, before. And that, and like, our work structure has changed our um, our production, like what we do, has changed. Um, so why why wouldn't retail and these other things change along with it? I'd like to remind everyone that these presentations are uploaded, and we should encourage our colleagues and uh, friends and those folks to, to look at them and provide comments back to myself or Administrative Officer Bill Salvi, uh, and they'll make their way back to our selection and search committee. Thank you okay. very much, Kelly. Yeah, thanks for listening to me babble about my dissertation. <laughs>